So what I'd like to do is, uh, well, first of all, I'm sorry we can't be together in person, uh, but it's nice to be here virtually together. I wanna talk about the role of AI in screening and early detection. And so I'll start with a very brief context about AI and give then some examples from the research that we've been doing here at Stanford on uh, early detection and give a sense of how some of the AI research that's being done today can have an impact on uh, clinical early detection in the future. So just to form our connection to this topic, I thought I'd start with a patient. So this is an 83 year old woman who has an aortic valve replacement and occasionally gets into problems with congestive heart failure and needs a chest X-ray like this one. She had about 18 months ago and was read as normal. She came back recently and you can see she now has a large mass in her right lung. And if you look carefully back at the prior image, you can see partially hiding behind a rib and nestled among the vessels the, that feed the right lung, there is a small mass. So this is really the kind of issue that diagnostic imagers in medicine deal with. Uh, they involve subtle perceptions, high stakes problems, not always well suited for human perception like needle in a haystack type problems. And our literature has shown over, again, over and over again that diagnostic problems uh, typically have an error rate of about three to 6% of clinically significant uh, errors. So we need help is the bottom line. And one of the many use cases for artificial intelligence is to prevent these kinds of diagnostic errors and to do this early detection. So we feel a special obligation to bring these technologies to, to patients. This more recent revolution in AI got started just about uh, maybe eight years ago now. Uh, I came across it at the 50th anniversary celebration of the computer science department here at Stanford. Fei-Fei Li showed this picture. All of the captions generated here are automated, generated by AI. So a bottle of water, cup of coffee, plate of fruit. And when you start thinking about what we do, particularly in imaging and medicine, we do the exact same thing. We look at images, we describe what we see in terms of the anatomy, the observations and so forth. So people got really excited about bringing this technology to healthcare. Uh, just a brief note about how it works. So it's machine learning, meaning we provide examples, positive and negative examples. We feed it into a neural network, which is really just a big system of equations, which is why I like the Greek letters on this slide. It just says it's just mathematics. And then the, uh, the equation provides us an answer. Is it malignant or benign? And based on whether the answer is right or wrong, uh, the computer scientists have figured out ways to slightly modify the coefficients in that model each time. So over billions of iterations, the performance of that machine learning model can be outstanding. And this is really the focus of the Stanford Amy Center to conduct this kind of machine learning research to optimize how clinical images are used to promote health. And when then we've recently broadened our focus to clinical data of all kinds because we recognize the kinds of questions we want to answer, whether it's early detection or something else, really involve not just the image, but data from the health record, data from wearables, genomics, and all of those other types of data. So we have, uh, and I'll feature now, the work of some of our over 100 faculty across 20 departments, predominantly in medicine and engineering. And you can see there some of our uh, key collaborators in the computer science department. We have projects ongoing across different organ systems and different imaging modalities. And so I'm just gonna be featuring some of those. These are our radiology examples, but I'll, as you'll see, we have examples in, in other uh, imaging modalities as well. So I'll start with the work of Matt Lundgren. This is a uh, work on detection of abnormalities in chest radiographs that would actually help with the problem I showed you earlier with that lung nodule that was not detected. And partnering with uh, Andrew Ng's lab in computer science and Pranav Rajprakar found that they could detect 14 abnormalities at about the level of human experts. The model was better at one out of the 14. The humans were better at three and the rest were uh, basically a wash. Here's some more of their data. Just showing here the purple uh, is the algorithm versus the open diamonds being trainees and the closed diamonds being experienced radiologists board certified. And you can see across measures of uh, performance and accuracy that the model is really uh, performing at a, at a human level. 
Another example that's really uh, critical and involves early detection and relates to some of the uh, things that uh, Carlos was mentioning earlier. And this is early detection of coronary disease. So on the left here, we have a gated CT scan. So we image at exactly the same time in the cardiac contraction cycle. So it freezes the heart. And you can see there the calcium is very easy to see in the coronary vessels. We can measure that. And that's a measure of risk of subsequent heart attacks and other coronary events. That, the problem is that is quite expensive, thousands of dollars. On the right, we have a CT scan. We do hundreds of thousands of these every year. And we don't freeze the heart because we're looking for other things like pneumonia or lung nodules. And as you can see in the yellow circles, the calcium is kind of smudged in this case. This is the same patient. But we developed an AI algorithm, a machine learning algorithm that can still assess the risk of coronary disease just based on the less distinct calcium in the study on the right. And so you can get this risk assessment now for no additional cost for everyone who's having a CT for other reasons. So that's a, a really nice opportunistic way to screen for early disease. The next example is one from dermatology. This is the work of uh, by the way, the coronary work is Bhavik Patel working with Andrew Ng and our boot camp group and some of the cardiologists here at Stanford, uh, David Marin and others. Uh, this is the work of Eleni Linos in dermatology and Olivia Gavart in biomedical data science. And they're building uh, an AI model for a type of cancer called basal cell uh, cancer of the skin. It's not a particularly aggressive cancer, but it's, its incidence is, is more than two times all other cancers combined. And they, these lesions do need to be treated with a surgical procedure that does have a, a significant complication rate of about 27%. But there's good evidence in older patients that you can uh, actively surveil the lesions, look for changes, and only intervene when the, it becomes more urgent. And so this is a tool that using a cell phone, taking photographs of the lesion to surveil these lesions. And, and you can imagine using the same technology to screen for skin cancer and, and the like. This is an example from my laboratory, uh, AI screening for breast cancer early detection. Uh, postdoc Rohir Vanderslees with Saeed Sayedi, Margaret Wong, Debbie Keda, and who's a mammographer and myself. So the way that uh, breast screening typically occurs is uh, patients get a mammogram or increasingly a technology called breast tomography, essentially a, a CT-like image of the breast. That's in a screening mode, we get two views. It's read by a radiologist who decides is that negative, in which case the patient goes to their routine screening protocol, typically annually. If it's positive, the patient then might come back seven or more days later, they get, uh, they get a diagnostic tomogram or mammogram, which is now three views in an attempt to better visualize that area. And again, looked at again by a radiologist, positive or negative. And the positive cases then undergo a workup, either a needle biopsy or surgery or some other uh, intervention to determine whether that, that tissue is, is cancerous. So uh, you look at where is machine learning and AI typically applied. It's often in this area to augment or assist the radiologist in finding these lesions. This technology has actually been available since 15 or so years ago using older AI methods. And now we have newer ones that, that provide even better accuracy. But we've been experimenting with applying AI at an earlier stage. So can you find an artificial intelligence algorithm that would be sensitive enough that if it were negative, you knew that that patient had not, nothing in their breast and could, be, uh, uh, could undergo routine annual screening without having a radiologist look at it? Or in Europe, where these mammograms are looked at by two radiologists, could the AI serve as one of those radiologists? So add value in that way to early detection. So we put together a, a, a machine learning model. I won't go into the details here, but we needed to do some, these are very large images and yet you can't really downsample the resolution because you're looking for these tiny microcalcifications that can be evidence of early cancer. And, and so we're trying to distinguish those screening studies that may need to be uh, that, that, may, that could be normal. Just some of the results. So these are ROC curves. You wanna be up and to the left is high accuracy. And we took a look at the issue I mentioned earlier, image resolution. Do we really need these very large images or could we use a simpler AI model? 
And in fact, you find that if you try to downsample the images, you do lose accuracy uh, quite dramatically. And on the right, the size of the data set is very important. So we have a, a fairly large data set here at Stanford that we were using. We intend to grow it because we think we can add to the accuracy of the model. Um, but there's no question that, that you need these quite large data sets. And I'll talk about more about uh, the need for data in just a minute. The next example is not technically an early detection example, but I did want to uh, highlight it because it, it illustrates some of the uh, problems of bias and equity that uh, Carlos highlighted in his talk as well that can occur when you're dealing with artificial intelligence algorithms. So this is the case of bone age. You may have a child, there's a suspicion that there's some kind of developmental delay and you want to get a sense of the child's chronological age. You know the child's chronological age, you want to compare it to their physiologic age. And so you can take an x-ray of the hand and wrist and based on the uh, development of the bones in the hand and wrist, you can compare it to an atlas uh, called Grulik and Pyle. And you know, you page through the atlas, this is the state of the art, page through and you find a, an x-ray that looks about the same as your patient and that's labeled as the canonical seven and a half year old. And you say, okay, this patient's physiologic age must be seven and a half. The reference data for that study came from this book and it was the reference data was developed from 300 white children in Cleveland in the 1950s. So we thought this was a good, this was David Larson's work, one of the first models, I think the first model published in the journal radiology of this kind of machine learning in uh, radiology. And you can see here, so lower bars are better. This is the difference between the estimate of the model or the human and the, the ground truth. And you can see that uh, compared to for humans here, the model was better. The, the lighter bars are the, the computer. Models were better than two humans, about the same as two others. So again, expert level performance that we're getting from this AI model. And this, these are just some uh, class activation heat maps to show that the, the model is looking at the right places, the joints and the wrists where we were looking for the development of the bones. So uh, the interesting point I wanna make about this is that this model is providing the right answer for white children. Uh, and the question is, is it providing the right answer for other ethnic groups? And we now know that, uh, so the, the way to answer that, the ethics of that question is to, you know, should we just go ahead and develop other, other models, some for black children, some for Asian children and so on? Well, that, may not be appropriate if the reason for the differences might be something like uh, nutritional differences or other things that we could change in society to make things more equal. Or it could be that it's really just genetic differences and it makes complete sense to develop different models for different groups. It turns out that it is in this case, genetic differences. And so it would make sense. And these machine learning methods allow us to develop these models quite rapidly now. But it just goes to, to show that when you face these kinds of issues with AI of uh, bias and ethics, that you can't always answer them just by further analyzing the data in front of you. You really need to think about the larger context and whether you're answering the right questions. And that leads to, uh, just to, to emphasize that point, this is some work that uh, Amit Kaushal, one of our bioengineering faculty and, and Russ Altman and, and I did uh, looking at all of the data sets that were uh, used to train uh, imaging uh, diagnostic models, machine learning models. And you can see heavily weighted, more than half of them were from just three states, California, Massachusetts, and New York. So we're not getting a diverse set of data as our method to train these models. So one of the responses to that is this uh, project called Medical Imaging and Data Resource Center that many of us are involved with here at Stanford and across the country. The original motivation for this is COVID, but could be used for any kind of imaging question for machine learning, uh, including early detection and screening. The idea is to build the infrastructure and technology to aggregate large numbers Im of images from across the country, the COVID-based images in this case, but again, the infrastructure could generalize many collaborative machine learning research projects based on that. And we're planning to aggregate tens of thousands of studies uh, in the first year. So you can see it's a collaborative project of a number of the major imaging societies in North America funded by the, the NIH. So that's just an example of some of the ways that we can combat this problem of uh, 
data bias and, and being able to aggregate enough data that we can actually provide machine learning solutions for all of the different groups that we may want to do, do that for. So with that, uh, as you look at our nice space over at 1701 Page Mill, just it's an exciting time in this field. There are immense possibilities. I hope I've given you some of the ways in which AI will affect uh, screening and early detection uh, in the future. And so I, with that, I thank you and turn it back to Ryan and I look forward to your questions. Thanks so much, Kurt. Yeah, it's really exciting. And yeah, a lot of, I, I didn't realize you expanded to other data sets besides imaging. So I think that's that's also really you know a great opportunity for your group. Um, and one of the questions we often get is, you know, where can we get additional training sets? So I think your one of your last slides you mentioned that the medical imaging and data resource. So is that something like any data scientist is able to get access to that has you know, okay? Yes, it is. Uh, so there are a few ways. This, the, the issue of AI ready data sets is a good one. There aren't a lot. There are some public data sets, not typically AI ready. Uh, Ron Summers group from the NIH started it all with a release of about 30,000 chest X-rays. Uh, there's a nice data set at, uh, from NYU of, of knee MR uh, reconstruction. We have released through our Amy Center nine different AI ready data sets. And then this MIDRIC will be uh, aggregating data. If you go to data.midric.org, you'll find there are already a couple thousand cases of COVID, AI ready COVID data there. And we're, we'll be releasing in the next month or two about 25,000 more cases, including CTs and X rays. So uh, this is something that we feel strongly about that, you know, making data available, that's one of the things that really caused the revolution is that there, there was this database called ImageNet that Fei-Fei Li put together of 14 million images and they had contests every year and we felt that having challenges like that on clinical data and making those available would really drive the field. So we think it's important. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, you gave a lot of really great examples. Um, you know, what, what are like some of the, the most significant differences you've seen? You know, I, I guess if you're looking at maybe between the AI versus uh, like clinician performance, um, you know, what context do you think it seems to have the, like the most impact, for instance? Yeah. Well, so we think that it could have an impact across the whole cycle of looking at imaging specifically. So selection of the right imaging test. How do you protocol? Make sure you do the right sequences on the device. Uh, the reconstruction of the images can be aided by AI so that you need lower dose, lower contrast dose, shorter sequences on MR. And then uh, things like early detection, a triage. So which images should I read first? Um, early detection, classification, prediction, uh, monitoring, uh, all the way to even communication to make sure that the results get to the right place at the right time, reminding the, the clinician to do that communication. So across the board. And the other thing I would say in terms of trends is that although I showed a lot of comparisons between computer and human, really I think the, the trend now is to look at human alone versus human plus AI, because we find that that's, that augmentation piece is really the way these systems are gonna be used. So that's what we wanna measure. And then I guess, you know, to, to that point, um, I guess, you know, not all physicians are as savvy data scientists like yourself. Um, so how do you ensure kind of the user interface is, you know, it seems like it has a huge amount of potential, but it could also be add burden maybe if they don't know how to utilize some of these tools? So true. Yes. And I'd say that's still work in progress. Well, I don't know that there are is anywhere where there's a beautifully scalable way to implement AI today. We've done a, a nice clinical trial of our bone age algorithm, a multi-institutional clinical trial in real practice. And there are other trials like that that have occurred. Um, the standards, so you've got out there an industry at the RSNA in 2019, there were 130 companies in the AI showcase that all were selling AI products. So it's a huge industry out there right now. Uh, and there are you know, dozens of PAX vendors that do our image display. So how those are gonna communicate, the standards for that were just released over the summer, haven't really been fully implemented yet. There are a number of different ways to do it. So you can you know, overlay heat maps, you can um, provide information, pre-fill some fields in the radiology report if you're doing things like measurements automatically. Um, you can reorder work lists automatically. So all of those things 
are possible, but I would say there, there aren't really standard ways. So if you have one AI vendor and one PAX vendor, connecting them together is still a custom project today. But I think as the standards come in and there's more experience, I think we'll see more and more about that. And we'll get more experience about what radiologists want to see. Um, there definitely have been experiences with particularly breast computer aided detection from 15 years ago where they were putting markers on lesions and finding that it didn't help very much because the accuracy was such that it was, you know, it was, was causing a lot of false positives and the radiologists weren't paying as close attention. And so we think with the better accuracy of these systems and perhaps some improved user interfaces that we can make them more effective.